A great scholar once asked, why die? Why die indeed? Let's not. But what precisely can we do today to stop aging tomorrow? I assume you did your homework and watched the background material. Let's continue. Your substitute teacher today is Dr. Peter Allen. That's me, bioanalytical chemist and host of this Science Curious channel. And yes, your teacher said we could show a movie, at least part of it. But I am determined to advance your education, at least a little. Let's ask what is aging at four different levels of complexity. Look, aging is universal, or almost universal. I see you with your tentacle up, Hydra. I know this doesn't apply to you. You can go work on your division. A few short hundred years ago, we learned that bacteria caused infections and disease. Once we got that crucial piece of information correct, we figured out how to not die from bacteria so much. That used to be a thing. See bubonic plague and cholera and dysentery. People used to poop themselves to death with incredible frequency. We do a lot better now. Once we understood bacterial infection, we learned to fight bacterial infection. The Fountain of Youth has crocked up in folklore since time immemorial, seriously since at least Herodotus 2400 years ago. Despite that, we still get old. Humanity has not had a germ theory moment with regard to aging. There's no one weird trick to live longer because we don't understand aging yet. The insights that will cure aging will come from higher levels of analysis. But let's start simple. Take a breath, this is the easiest level. At the kid-friendly level, we're ready for stories. As promised, we can put on a family-friendly movie to pass some of the time. Growing old is part of the great circle of life. We each grow old in our time so that we will be grateful for the time we have. Getting old gives purpose and a meaning to life. That's a just-so story, a speculative story to explain the origin of something. Never verified, often not verifiable. I hope you all enjoyed that. Don't groan, we'll come back to it. Simple stories are the starting point. It's the default mode, like superstition. It's the story we tell when we don't know better, or before we're ready for something complex. A good story can help contextualize a hard subject. But the planets are not gods. Greek mythology is not astronomy. We can respect it for what it is. The people who told these stories enjoyed them. Even in modern times, mythology brings much-needed job opportunities to actors with cleft chins, and inspires decades of children's nightmares with delightful stop-motion animation. Sometimes, a good story contains wisdom. But even then, the best just-so story is not science. When we are ready, we can start to understand cause and effect. This is the level we, hopefully, reach by high school. We're ready to move past stories for children, but perhaps not yet ready for advanced mathematics. This is the beginning of empirical science. This level of thinking is based on experiments, measurements, and observations. It tends to be binary, true-false, hard categories. It can be very useful to think this way, but it is inherently incomplete. Let's consider germ theory again. This is a petri dish of bacteria. Some bacteria cause disease. If those bacteria grow in your body, you will be sick. Cause and effect. Consider this antibiotic experiment. Bacteria are ready to grow all over this plate. Bacteria make the white sheen on the red agar. But in the regions around the little white circles full of antibiotic, the bacteria don't grow at all. Cause and effect. Antibiotic causes dead bacteria. Here's the binary in action. Without antibiotic, bacteria live. With antibiotic, bacteria die. And this is very useful to medicine. Without antibiotic, patient dies. With antibiotic, patient is cured. This simple cause and effect relationship is easy to understand. We might call this the reductionist approach to science. It makes things into components and then understands each component part. This can be very useful, but not everything works like that. Let's return to the video and skip ahead a bit. Simba Ahem, the public domain generic cub, is older now. You think this school can afford to license anything from the mouse? Cub is ready for a deeper explanation. My cub, as we age, every injury, every failed hunt, every long migration, they wear down our bodies as the river wears away the rock. Time steals our strength, even as the hardest stone will weather away to nothing. 
Thank you, generic public domain daddy lion. That was an interesting hypothesis. There is nothing wrong with a simplification for children. There is nothing wrong with simplification for non-professionals or non-specialists. But all simplifications are, well, incomplete. They can mislead. Sometimes people say, it's scientifically proven, or it's scientific fact. All too often, the science they're talking about is a simplification for children. So is aging our body just wearing out? Is that a useful idea? Or is it too simplified? Here's our hypothesis. Aging is wearing out. And this kind of makes sense. Joints do degrade with overuse or injury. People who hurt their knee tend to get arthritis in that knee, for instance. So the wearing out hypothesis stands up to our first level of scrutiny. But if we were mechanical, like cars, that would suggest that the most sedentary people would be expected to live the longest. But that's not true at all. People who exercise more tend to live longer, actually. Another cause and effect hypothesis is aging is caused by telomere shortening. Inside the cell is the nucleus, and inside the nucleus are the chromosomes. And on each end of the chromosome, like aglets at the end of shoelaces, are the telomeres. Telomeres get shorter every time cells divide, so we tend to have shorter telomeres in old age. When they get too short, the cells can't replicate, and they die. But it turns out that cells can rebuild telomeres under some circumstances. So it's not just a simple timer that runs out. Again, simple cause and effect is a good start, but it's not going to adequately explain aging. We need a deeper understanding, something more nuanced. Let's move to a statistical perspective. This is more the kind of thing one might learn in college. We can skip the mathematical background and just explore the shape of it. They're still based on experiments, but they're not necessarily binary. Statistics are a useful tool for scientists, but they are harder to explain. Take this simple statement. Cigarettes cause cancer. Now this is true, but maybe not how you think. It sounds like it means if you smoke cigarettes, then you will get cancer. But it's more complicated. Smoking causes cancer, but it's about risk. It's about odds. In non-smokers, the risk of lung cancer is one non-zero number, about 1 in 200. In smokers, the risk of cancer is much higher, 20 times higher, in fact, or closer to 1 in 10. So smoking caused those additional cancers, but not all of the cancers. A few people would have contracted cancer anyway. And not every smoker gets cancer. One of my neighbors growing up had lung cancer. And apparently, a lot of people asked him how long he'd smoked, but he'd never smoked. It was tough for him when people assumed that they knew why he got sick and that his lung cancer was his own fault. Rarely, lung cancer just happens. Just as a public service announcement, smoking is bad. This should not be interpreted to mean that smoking is safe for anyone. Even for the smokers who die of something other than lung cancer, it's still not good for them. For example, smoking also causes heart disease, emphysema, stroke, and bronchitis, and smoking accelerates aging, increasing the odds of death from lots of other causes. Other things that increase the rate of aging are UV light, stress, and a sedentary lifestyle. There are also some things that slow aging. Exercise, calorie restriction, and a few drugs like metformin, and rapamycin. But how do we measure aging statistically when we make these claims? Well, let's talk about the experiment in mice. We can measure the rate of death in a population of mice over time. We can count the number of live mice, and as they die off due to old age, we can keep track of their lifespans. This is a statistical measure of aging, the odds of dying that increase over time. We can graph the mouse deaths over time just like this. This is called a Kaplan-Meier curve. What you will notice is that young mice have a near zero death rate, but old mice have a faster death rate. That change in the rate of death is the statistical measure of aging. We can do this for people, too. When the line changes like this, we know something slowed aging. Let's zoom in. The result from metformin is particularly impressive. People with diabetes, who tend to die younger, actually outperformed healthy controls when they had metformin. Foreman. That line got pushed out farther, indicating a slower rate of death or a slowed aging. Statistical reasoning is how we can test anti-aging drugs like this. 
The Kaplan-Meier curve is how we test anti-aging drugs. We can find something that changes with age, find a drug that reverses the change, then watch what happens to people on the drug using a KM curve to see whether it slowed aging or not. We want to see a big difference, something that's almost a binary. With it, no aging. Without it, aging. But remember, even without any aging, survival rate on a long enough timeline approaches zero. This isn't magic. Let's continue our movie with this in mind. If we are to understand the changes of aging, we must do experiments. We must make measurements. Our every development buys us time. Every benefit is another day, another week, someone's life. Boy, the tone of these new remakes sure has changed. The fourth level of understanding is systems biology. If aging can be cured, the work will happen at the systems level and not at simpler levels. This is something people are studying in graduate school. What is systems biology? We're still talking about experimental science, but the causes and effects are more interrelated. The math of systems biology was inspired by ecology, the study of relationships in nature. So what is a system? Put simply, it is a collection of smaller things that relate to one another. Like how the immune system is made of lots of different kinds of cells, or how a healthcare system is made of doctors and nurses and hospitals, and in the United States, insurance companies. Or the ecosystem is made of plants and bugs and prey and predators. Instead of studying all the parts in isolation, systems biology measures many things. Computers simulate all those things all at once, testing the simulation against all those measurements. Those simulations let us understand emergent properties, the phenomena that emerge when all the parts interact. Then we can use those new understandings to profit up, extend lifespan or health span. Let's make an analogy. The simulations are like a SimCity game. The rules are simple. Put different kinds of blocks down to help your simulated people grow and succeed. You need to put residential blocks for people to live in, commercial and industrial blocks for people to work and buy their stuff, streets for people to get between the two, but every choice affects the next choices. What you build and where affects where you can build and what options you have next. To some extent, a SimCity simulation reflects problems in real cities. How we play the game in the early stages creates emergent properties like traffic. Traffic is not a monster that arrives to destroy your city like Godzilla. It's a thing that happens when the places people live are far from the places where they work. It emerges from the design of the city. In systems biology, we can build simulations and check their accuracy with omics experiments. Genomics, proteomics, metabolomics, measuring all the genes or proteins or metabolites all at once. It's like taking a satellite image of the whole city and then collecting lots of statistics. It's a way to test whether the sim city we built actually matches real city behavior. If we built a sim city that matches some real city as closely as possible, same geography, same layout of the streets and buildings and zoning laws, then we could collect data. And if the real city matches sim city data, we can start to measure the emergent properties of the simulation and then have confidence that they are like the real emergent properties in the real city or in real biology. We can do experiments in the simulation then. We can predict the effects that might be produced by changing conditions. Aging is a phenomenon that emerges from all these biological parts interacting. To solve it, we're going to need to understand how those parts interact and what happens when we perturb them. Here's a quote from a review article about the system's biology of aging. Harmon's free radical theory of aging proposed that organisms age because cells accumulate free radical damage over time. However, a number of experiments have since demonstrated that free radicals have important signaling roles that are essential for survival, and only when in great excess do they negatively affect cell and organismal survival. Intermediate levels of both antioxidants and free radicals are optimal and therefore tightly regulated. We see this repeatedly. The units we study, molecules, pathways, cells, and organs are part of larger systems, and their behavior cannot be fully understood outside of their interactions with the other units and the state of dynamics of the system as a whole. So consider our SimCity traffic analogy. Traffic gets worse the closer you get to the end of the game. It might be easy to assume you can reduce the number of cars and that would help your city survive longer, but if you just get rid of all the cars, that could cause much bigger problems. The traffic is there because it has emerged from the needs of the simulated people. They need to get from their home to their businesses. Making that impossible is a bad idea. It's not as simple as cars bad. We need to understand the whole system to intervene effectively. 
Let's watch this last clip and see if it all makes sense. Each of our bodies is like the whole of the savanna. Every cell is a part of an interrelated ecology. Everything is regulating everything else. The lions and hyenas eat the antelope and the zebras, who might otherwise eat too much grass. The antelope are so quick that the slow predators feed the insects and the worms. For a time, there is balance. Someday, even the savanna will change. Once, there was a jungle here. In an age to come, this may be only desert. We try to keep the balance as long as we can. This is a summary of all the main hallmarks of aging. Each one is a whole subfield with scientists who specialize in studying just that one aspect. Understanding each may yet help us understand the whole. It may be that they all cause each other. How confusing. How could we get to the root of the problem? Or if there is no root, how do we intervene in everything all at once? Systems biology is the way to think about answering that question. Thinking in terms of systems will help us understand lots of things, not just aging. The truth is that when people have a lot of experience in a field, they almost inevitably start thinking in terms of systems. Here are a few examples of how systems thinking might inform other fields. An experienced mechanic looks, and he sees the systems in a car differently than a new, young, inexperienced mechanic. The new mechanic looks at the brake shoes. They're thin, they're worn, he replaces them. But an experienced mechanic might know that the problem could be a deeper one. The brakes are wearing out because there's too much movement in the bearings. They're going to fail soon. He saves the customer from a bad accident because he understands the whole system and not just the brakes. Ecosystems were one of the original ideas that led to systems models. We can learn about a single species, what it eats, how it behaves, but to really understand that species, we need to know its relationship to all the other creatures it lives with. Salmon population relates to bears and beavers and orcas and hydroelectric dams and the health of the salmon's prey like the smaller fish and the shrimp. Changing any one of those could affect all the others. Consider how price works in the economy. We understand that price is what we have to pay to get something. We get that simple supply and demand determines prices, but more subtly, price changes are an economic signal for businesses. When prices rise, there's new demand, and sellers are motivated to meet it. This is a complex feedback system with literally millions of parties involved, businesses changing their activities to respond to price, but having the effect of changing the price. We need systems-level thinking to grasp this idea. Learning to think and analyze things at a higher level almost always makes it possible to be more accurate. But the simpler explanations are not lies. Those explanations are just incomplete. Part of thinking scientifically is understanding that every level of understanding is incomplete. Science is a process of becoming less wrong. I hope we can learn enough so that we can extend human life and flourishing, and I think that's going to require us to meet these higher levels. Well, thank you very much for showing up. This has been a bit of a different kind of video for me, but I hope you've enjoyed it. It was obviously an homage to one of my favorite creators, CGP Grey, but I did my best to put relevant information into it. I've been thinking a lot about aging, and certainly Mr. Grey's video got me started down that path, so much uh, credit to him, and I hope that you will give me some feedback and let me know if you'd like to see more like this. In any case, we will see you next time.